Well, here it is, folks, an annual tradition as we conclude another North Dakota State football season with our annual season-ending awards. Jeff Kolpak, of course, in studio. You've dressed up for the occasion. Well, that's, that's a, a sharp, big deal. That's a sharp-looking coat. Well, I like know, that. Halber stats. So uh, here we are. It's become tradition as we're sitting here in middle of January and putting a bow on the North Dakota State football season. Your analysis is available at Inforum.com for everybody to read. I don't want to steal all the good stuff, but just as you looked over things, was there anything that really stood out to you, surprised after looking at all 15 games of of how this season played out? Well, I guess the way the season ended, uh, do we dare? Do we look at the negative first? I, sure. I suppose that's, that's what, what we do. To talk about. <laughs> well, it's run defense. This uh, in the 10 year title run since 2011 that um, uh, 10 appearances that this was the worst run defense in all those years. Yeah. So it was 155 yards a game or something given up. And, and, and a few years there, they're around 80 to 90 yards given up. And, and just as simple as that, if you can't stop the run, yeah. it, it makes everything else tougher. South Dakota state was the number one run defense in, in the country this year. What happened? 157 yards per game was the actual number on rushing yards. And we saw it, honestly, maybe in the first game of the season. Yeah. And I know it was Drake, and maybe we made too much of it, but it was readily apparent in game one. And I don't know if it just, I don't think it rectified itself pretty much all. The tackling got better. Got better. But the actual rush defense, I don't know if it actually got better as the season went along. Yeah. And, you know, and you look at, okay, why did that happen? Right. And, it, and they were 61st in the in the country in run defense. So it wasn't horrible. It was average by FCS standards. But average doesn't win you in Frisco, right. and especially in that area. It was, uh, I think, a combination of inexperience up front. Linebacking play was just okay. Yep. It was average. And uh, you combine those two factors, it's, you, you don't make teams one-dimensional. Right. That's an, that's an issue. And yet – they were still 12-3. and three. I think we need to remind everybody, myself included on that, they yeah, made it to the national yeah, yeah. championship game. But for the standard that they have set, I think that was glaring. It, it it never really went away as the season went along, and it certainly reared its head in the championship game against the Jackrabbits. Right, and this show, we will get it's all about the positivity because yeah. of the year-end <laughs> awards, so maybe we'll start off with that and, and morph into it. But 12-3 and three by college football standards is outstanding. Oh. And for, I mean, every other program in the country wins. would take that. In they, they won 12 games. Right, exactly. It made the national championship. Uh, for those that are new to this, we have four categories. We have offensive MVP, defensive MVP, most improved player, which is always my favorite category, and then who to watch, who we think might potentially could break through in 2023. You are the esteemed author of numerous books, so you get to lead off offensive MVP we will start with? Well, I'm going with one that's almost hard to measure. They do measure offensive linemen in, in terms of uh, of percentages, yep. right, and, and, and knockdowns and all that. I'm going with Cody Malk as my MVP. I thought he was a, a rock throughout the season. Uh, obviously, he has got high regard by the, by the analysts, and uh, I just thought he uh, left tackle as a spot, and if you look through the years, that NDSU is really good at, and and I think that's uh, and they were really good. They they had a great run running attack this year, uh, third in the country yeah. in rushing offense. So I'm going with the uh, the Hankinson Flash. And now you put this up with the other left tackles, and he's going to be the next one drafted with Billy Turner to Joe Haig, to Dylan, Dylan Raidens. Raidens after that to Cordell Volson. I know he didn't play left tackle to now. This guy, which you ended up finishing his career with only over 40 consecutive starts, who came in as a as a tight end. Bison offensive line was the one unit that could sustain the injuries. They lost two starters because of this guy, the left side. They were just as good all season long. They, they were. Yeah, they're out. The title game was okay. Yeah. You know, I think there was a little letdown there. They faced there, a but really good run defense they did. that and day. And again, like I said, yep. the number one run defense in the country. Cody Malk is another farm kid. And how many farm kids have we done? <laughs> stories have we done on no farm doubt. kids? Over the years, they, they just work and work and work, and, and and they develop. That's the biggest thing. The thing that has also been remarkable over this whole run, Jeff, is they've been able literally to plug and play a guy at left tackle. That might be the hardest spot to find, maybe outside of defensive tackle, and literally they have been able to do that throughout this entire run. Made famous in the country by the movie The Blind Side yeah. with, uh, with the importance of the position, but it is literally the quarterback, a right-handed quarterback. It is his right. blind side, and you better be – uh, you better have some um, some some reliable guys there. That's athletic for sure. guy, no athletic. doubt. Athletic.
I struggled on this for my offensive okay. MVP. I, I, I was I, I really thought of going with Hunter Lifke. And I think had he played the entire season, I think it's a no brainer. Absolutely. I think he's actually in Frisco to uh p- potentially accept the Walter Payton Award, uh, even with Lindsey Scott's numbers. Uh I did not go Lifke. I went with Kobe Johnson. And I under- I know Kobe missed a couple games. He ended up finishing the year nine hundred and sixty one rushing yards. He had nine touchdowns. He had a receiving touchdown. He was, I think, maybe the most reliable guy, Jeff. Is that maybe the best way to say it out of the Bison backfield? I, I, despite the fact he missed a couple games, his home run ability, you saw it in this game especially, the game against Montana and, and the game against Incarnate Word where he had three touchdowns, that his value coming back next season can't be measured in my mind. He was my MVP this year. Matt Ant said on a few occasions on his Monday press conferences that Kobe is running harder this yeah. year. And I think that was evident. And he's a captain, too. They yes, can't overlook right. that. He ended up finishing the season. Also, they used him. He had five receptions for 36 yards and a touchdown. That's another element of the game they hadn't used prior to this season was using Kobe out of the backfield, and that, that worked. Of course, they had the uh, wheel route that went for a touchdown at Southern Illinois this year. Well, I think guys like Chase Morlock and Bruce Anderson, Crockett, and those guys, uh, they were uh, very effective out of the yeah. backfield on on passing occasions, and uh, that as a it's a needed element, yep. I think, in this offense. I think his availability for next season can't be measured. I know there's another spot the Bison always find running backs. I get that, but to have him and Tameric Williams, as we understand it now, as we record this back for 2023, that's a heck of a starting place for the Bison backfield. It's a great starting place, yeah. and again, I, I like their 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 I like the way the physical nature of the way Kobe has developed. I mean, yep. he was a smaller guy when he was a true freshman and not afraid to go in the middle right. as a smaller guy, but now he's just more effective going up the middle. Okay, defensive side of the ball. Here's what I hemmed it hot on this one as well because I was I saw your pick. I'm like, I'm not, we're, I want to, I don't want to double up. Yep. And your pick is really good. Um, so might, might be controversial. I went with James Kayser. And it's easy to look at the numbers. Kayser led the team in tackles, he had four sacks, he had a pick. He played 14 of 15 games. I thought he was ultra durable this year, something that we have not seen out of Kayser over the last couple of years, that he's missed time. But he was as reliable a guy at that spot. We harped on linebacker all season long, Colpac, about what that position was. If there was anything that Kayser was, he was reliable. I thought that's why he got my MVP vote this well, year. Well, anytime you lead the team in tackles, you're uh, certainly a candidate for yep. defensive MVP. I'm going with Dawson Weber. And the reason I'm going with Dawson Weber is I thought he was a rock in the backfield. F- led the team in interceptions with uh, with five yep. this year. He had four last year. That's a pretty good production. And the fact that you never saw receivers getting behind the bison. It's a great secondary. point. You wrote that in your analysis, and you're dead on about it. And we're looking at the highlights here. Uh, so this is the, the not the big one against Incarnate Word, but never. It never happened this year that you saw a 75-yard touchdown pass against the Bison. No, the longest pass play this year was by UND's uh, Bell Bell Belquist, Belquist, yeah, and that was just a simple out, yeah, a, a screen pass almost that he took uh, to the two-yard line for I believe 65 yards, and that was the longest play. You never saw the, the that that deflating bomb, no. you know, that just uh, that that would kill a team. That's a spot here we'll talk about as we now look forward to 2023 in the coming days and weeks. That safety with those two guys, with Weber and Michael Tutsi, both moving on. That's a huge question mark for the Bison moving forward. And Weber made his biggest plays in the biggest moments. The first interception against James Madison in the national championship game against Montana State. The two against Incarnate Word. I mean, you can't ask for bigger moments to have the huge plays that he had. Right, and I thought the the one against um, Incarnate Word was just a veteran play yeah. that uh, with Lindsey Scott rolling out and and his quote was the ball seemed to, it was up there for yeah. 30 minutes yeah. or 30 seconds or something like that. But those veteran plays are what get you to, it was what got the Bison to yep. Frisco and clutch, like you said, very clutch. Okay, so now we go to a category I always enjoy, most improved. And I, this is a very subjective deal because you could look at stats and go, okay, well, that guy had a huge year as opposed to last year. It can mean just what he meant on the sidelines, on the field, a little bit of both. You can lead us off on most improved. Right, and there. I'm going with Zach Mathis, the senior receiver mm. who's coming back for another year. And first of all, he got he stayed healthy the whole year. He played every that, game that was, this year. And that was yep. the biggest thing. But just the stats aside, okay, I know he led the team in receptions with 35. Before that, he had, his career high was eight yeah. in 2021. But there was a certain factor that 
they recruited a six six guy to be that that re, you know the receiver the possession receiver if you will and he was that guy this year they used him in the right spots right there against Indiana State that Cam Miller put the ball the only way it could be put yeah. and used his height and he developed some moves here this year too that was another one against Indiana State where he juked the guy outside and went in and those are plays that we just never saw Zach Mathis make until this year. Um, I just like the way that he, he seemed a little more fearless going across the middle too, despite being uh, injury plagued throughout his career. So happy he stuck with it. Yeah, uh, he's he's a great interview and great sound, and <laughs> and he's a media guy by the way, has the radio experience. So like the fact he's coming back for another year. And Jeff, he was big in the national championship game. That alone, I mean, he took some shots on Sunday in the title game in Frisco and caught, came up with the ball every time. Toughness was another thing. Go back to your point about durability. That was something at least I saw out of Mathis all season long. Yep, and and, and that was the uh, the unseen factor yeah, right. in him in his career. You know, a kid out of Tampa who's, uh, you know, he's, he's not really thick, but I think he's developed some strength over the years too. 520 yards, three touchdowns. His longest catch was 40. It was that touchdown against North Carolina A&T. But, boy, you look at that Indiana State game where he got pushed out of bounds, came back in, made a huge play on third and 18 that – the Bison ended up scoring the, the go-ahead touchdown to win that football game. He had another big one on a third down against South Dakota, I remember, earlier in the season. Just his ability to go up and get the football was a needed element for Cam Miller, I think, this season. And really one was. stat I'd like to see improve with him next year is touchdowns. He had three this yep. year. I think he can increase that. Double he, that, maybe? Uh, absolutely. Yep. I, I think they can use him better down in the red zone. I'm staying in the quote-unquote receiving core uh, for my most improved and – a guy who was kind of thrust into more action because of injury is Joe Stuffel. I thought guy that was highly touted out of River Falls, Wisconsin, and we saw it as the season went along when Noah Gindorf went down that he's a he's a good blocker, but he's got good hands, ability to get out an open field like he did against Samford in the FCS quarterfinals here. I, I really liked what he brought to the table. He ended up finishing – uh, the second leading receiver, 25 catches, 276 yards. Obviously, he had a touchdown in the national championship game. But when when Gindorf went down, Stuffel, first game against South Dakota, stepped right up and was a viable receiver for Cam Miller. He reminds me, and just not because of the uniform number, but he reminds me a bit of, of, of Ben Ellison. Mm-hmm. And he, he's not there yet, and I'm not no. calling him Ben Ellison, but just the way he moves, I, I think the height and weight, he's got some uh, resemblance there. What I'm really interested to see next year, he's going to be the guy. Gindorf is gone. The Bison need to develop some depth behind him, and maybe that'll come in the form of, of Finn Diggins or uh, Carson Williams and a couple other guys that are on the roster. He's A1, though, Jeff. When we look at the depth chart for spring ball, tight end one is is Stuffel. And, I, again, he had, what did he finish, 25 receptions? That's a lot for a tight end. And Can he get to 35, 40? I don't know. Is, well, that, is that too many? We'll, we'll see. It depends yeah. how many games yeah, they play right. next year, but uh, certainly has the potential. And here's a guy who's living up to his potential. Yes, at, with the amount of offers that he had and some high-profile ones uh, on the FBS route, that was uh, impressive to me. Okay, now for fair, I went back and looked, and people can go back at Inforum.com and watch. I look back at our uh, who to watch for 2022. And how do we do? I'd say a mixed bag right. is probably the best way. You picked Noah Gindorf, and because of Gindorf's injury – of him having a big 2022. I think he was on par for that yeah, before yeah, the if injury he happened healthy, against there. Right. I mean, he played in the three games. He had a great touchdown in the first game against Drake. I picked DJ Hart. I think I should get partial credit for that. No, Hart was coming on before he decided to enter the transfer portal. He finished 13 receptions, 183 yards, a touchdown. His last game at NDSU, he has the 76-yarder against UND. So... Can I get partial credit for that I'll one? Give, I'll give you partial credit, yeah. And, and um, I don't know about the transfer. Yeah, Do that, that hurts. There? There's no yeah. doubt about that. Uh, so I'll lead off. And a guy um, that actually dressed as a true freshman this year, and I think Bison coaching staff really likes him. Def- We're talking about needing a guy in the defensive line. And I know it's young, but defensive end is a spot you can play as a youngster. I'm going with Kelton McCaslin, young man from Illinois, who played in one game this season. Got some good height to him, good reach as well. Bison coaching staff, from what I've been told, really, really likes the young man, uh, Jeffrey, that at a spot at DN, they're going to need a guy to step up 
He's got the – he's already 6'5", 222. So by the time we get to fall camp, what are we thinking? 6'5", 240, 245 I, probably? Well, for him to make a difference, I think you got to be at least around that. I think – Let's just keep an eye on okay. what number 92 can do in the in the fall of 2023. That's my guy for who to watch for next season. Yeah, the, the guy I watch is not so much because of the guy, but the position switch mm. that we anticipate uh, Jalen Sundell making. He was a center this year before getting hurt. I anticipate they will move him to left guard when he comes back for his Guard or co- tackle? Or tackle, I'm okay. sorry. Back to left tackle, yeah. which, again, earlier in the show, we described the importance of, uh, of left tackle and the lineage of NDSU yeah. – left tackles you're talking you know billy turner then we said Hag, radens volson i think he played right tackle and he maybe did a little yep. left tackle uh, cody malk uh, leaving for the will get drafted this year it's a huge spot in the ndsu offense jalen sundell was mr football in, in the state of missouri Great. as a high school kid he's been his, uh, his whole athletic family is crazy and, and that's the, the key athleticism you need athleticism at the left tackle you need good feet you need good reach I think this uh, – he's not a young man anymore. I, I think Jalen Sundell fits that bill. Sundell coming back for an extra year of eligibility A, a guy well. to watch as a left tackle. So, as we potentially anticipate for the Bison line next season, could be Sundell at the left side, Zabel maybe at left guard. You bring Westberg back at center, and then your right side is still the same with Kubis at right guard and Mason Miller, who remember started the first 10 games of the season – at right tackle. That's pretty good. It's you the got strength that. of the team coming back, yeah. but without a question. When you look, and we'll get into this uh, for 2020, was there any snubs? Anybody going to sit there? Did you? Were there any ones that you really like? Hemmed, I really no, hemmed it hard. I, I guess I, no, I didn't. I went right to, to this position. I think it's that big, and I, I think this guy is going to have a huge role in this team next year. Any other categories that you debated for a bit that you had to hammer well, out? You're, you're talking about. Um, you know, defensive MVP, uh, yeah. I, I thought was I, – I went back and forth with that one. Uh, to me, it wasn't really clear-cut. I that's I agree. That, yeah. to me, I think you're – and maybe that you goes know, Michael back – Michael Tutsi had a good right, year, Right, and that maybe goes back to our opening topic about how the Bison defense played. Again, not poorly, and I, I want to stress that. They didn't play poorly this season. It was just a different kind of Bison defense in 2022. Well, statistically, it wasn't up to the championship team. You're right. So it's simple as that. What I am interested in as we look forward now for 2023 for the guys that are coming back, there's always one. I mean, Stuffle was a guy that we had heard about a, quite a bit first. Mathis is a great one that we had heard a ton about and yet to really do it on the field. That's what I'm always interested about. The guys that we have seen on the roster, who's going to burst out in 2023? Well, and I, you wonder if one of those freshman receivers. You're exactly right. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, Makai Collins, yep, Carson yep. Hagerly, those, those two. Those two yeah. right away. and. You know, will Eli Green up his game yeah. coming back? I think that's another guy to watch, too. The interesting part also, before we wrap up, is, again, we're still dealing with extra years of eligibility. Sun- Sundell is a perfect example of that, that there's still going to be a backlog. Jake Kubis. Kubis. I mean, Jake Cav is coming back. Tony Pierce coming back. There's a ton of guys that will be – Mathis, perfect example, going to use a six-year of eligibility. We're still going to deal with this for another couple of years with everybody, not just the Bison – on a backload of guys that are going to use their extra year of eligibility. Yeah, and I, I think once that cycles through, I think you're going to see the transfer portal come back to Constrict. Earth a little bit. Absolutely. All right, there you have it. You can send in your emails to jcolpack at <laughs> forumcom.com for any complaints. Hey, about I can our handle awards. it. I can handle it. <laughs> we both can on that. There it is, folks, our 2022 Bison Video Blog Award Show.